In all of American history, only two foreign leaders have addressed a joint session of Congress on at least three occasions. One was Winston Churchill during and after the Second World War, and the other is Benjamin Netanyahu, the longest serving Prime Minister in Israel's history. Netanyahu gave his first speech to Congress in 1996. As the newly elected, youngest Prime Minister in Israel's history, he received a warm reception from both sides of the political aisle. He was given a standing ovation when he pledged that in the next four years he would begin the long-term process of gradually reducing U.S. economic assistance to Israel. While there was all smiles and cheers during the public spectacle in front of Congress, Netanyahu's veneer of cordiality disappeared in a private meeting held afterward with President Bill Clinton. Netanyahu exhausted the U.S. President by giving a long and unsolicited lecture about the nature of Arabs, causing a fed-up Clinton to later remark privately, who the f does he think he is? Who's the f***ing superpower here? Netanyahu's last address to Congress was in 2015, just weeks before the legislative elections in Israel in which he would be re-elected to serve another term as Prime Minister. This time, the invitation to address Congress came not from US President Barack Obama, but from Republican House Speaker John Boehner. The Israeli PM took the opportunity to get directly involved in a partisan war that was taking place at the time between the US Democrats and Republicans. Siding with the GOP in the House, he publicly denounced the Iran nuclear deal President Obama was then in the process of negotiating. Without saying it directly, the Israeli Prime Minister may have just well have proclaimed to the collective body of US lawmakers that he could do diplomacy better than their own president. Still, Netanyahu was courteous enough to thank the United States for its generous military assistance. This time, however, he didn't bother to renew his original pledge to reduce Israel's reliance on US aid. In fact, Netanyahu was all too happy to accept the $38 billion military aid package to Israel signed by President Obama. Whether lecturing Clinton on Arabs or undermining Obama's diplomatic efforts, Netanyahu walked through the US halls of power as if he owned the place. He knows he can depend on the stalwart base of pro-Israel lobbyists, and he has become so self-assured that he can even manipulate and control US foreign policy. I know what America is, Netanyahu once said to a group of Israelis in 2001 when he apparently didn't know he was being recorded. America is a thing you can move very easily, move in the right direction they won't get in the way. Within the US-Israel alliance, Netanyahu does see himself as the one holding the cards, and his high opinion of himself may not be completely unwarranted. There has been serious scholarship that has argued that Israel, or at least the pro-Israel lobbying groups working on behalf of the interests of Netanyahu's Israel, are in fact the primary drivers of US foreign policy. For instance, in the book The Israel Lobby and US Foreign Policy, two leading political science scholars, John Mearsheimer and Stephen Walt, argue that that, quote, the overall thrust of US policy in the region, the Middle East, is due almost entirely to US domestic politics, and especially to the activities of the Israel lobby, end quote. Mearsheimer and Walt go as far as to say that even the 2003 Iraq invasion was, quote, motivated in good part by the desire to make Israel more secure. End quote. They point to the role of the small band of neoconservatives with close ties to Netanyahu's Likud party within the George W. Bush administration in propelling the U.S. into a war with Iraq. However, there are other critics who downplay the impact of the Israel lobby's influence in shaping U.S. foreign policy, and who believe that it is in fact the United States that controls Israeli policies and not the other way around. Some of Israel's sworn enemies take this position. For instance, Hassan Nasrallah, the leader of the Lebanese paramilitary organization and political party Hezbollah, was recently asked in an interview if the US would be accountable if Israel strikes Iran. And Nasrallah had this to say, <laughs> أنا اليهود هن حاكمين أمريكا وهن بياخدوا الحواء وهن عاملين وهن مساويين و... وما شاكلها أمريكا هي صاحبة القوى بأمريكا في شركات كبرى في مثلث فالوس شركات النفط شركات السلاح وما يسمى بالصهيونية المسيحية هو أصحاب الهواء هذا التحالف السرائيل كانت في الماضي أداة بريطانية والآن هي أداة أمريكية so, this raises a serious question. Who, in fact, calls the shots within the US and Israel's quote-unquote special relationship? What's the truth of the matter? Does Israel dictate US foreign policy? Or is in fact the US holding sway over Israel's policies? 
Certainly, on the surface level, it seems that Israel is the one with all the leverage, given that its prime minister apparently has the latitude to berate US presidents and still receive billions in foreign aid. But the truth of the matter is that Benjamin Netanyahu himself is an American creation. Netanyahu's political journey began in the United States. He became Prime Minister of Israel by Americanizing the politics of Israel. And while he may have insulted US presidents from Clinton to Obama and made himself a headache to Joe Biden as he seeks re-election, Netanyahu is still a product of the United States. In a sense, he can be compared to a Frankenstein monster, a creation of American political institutions that the US may now have lost control over. Please welcome the former Prime Minister of Israel, Benjamin Netanyahu. <laughs> and I know when Israeli politicians come to the United States, it usually means they're trying to get their old job back. No, actually it doesn't because, um, uh, because America is uh, of interest to us, whether in opposition or in government. America is important for everyone. But you do uh, want your old job back. Yes, I do. <laughs> well, that's the kind of honesty we don't have here in America <laughs> from our politicians. While he was born in Israel, Netanyahu grew up in the 1960s with an American upbringing. He graduated from Cheltenham High School in the suburbs of Philadelphia. Ben, as he was called by his American friends, later attended MIT and Harvard. In the late 1970s, he worked for the Boston Consulting Group, where he would make a lasting friendship with future Republican presidential nominee Mitt Romney. Initially, when Netanyahu returned to Israel with the desire to build a political career, his American upbringing was a liability. He was seen as something of a carpetbagger and not a true Israeli. He was still quote-unquote Ben and not yet quote-unquote Bibi. But in due time, Netanyahu's fluency and command of the English language, as well as his understanding of American culture, would end up working to his advantage. As the US and Israel's diplomatic relationship grew closer and closer, Netanyahu found ways to use his background to great advantage, paving the way for his ascendancy within Israeli politics. What was a liability at first turned out later to be his greatest asset. Netanyahu got his chance to exploit his Americanized background in building his political career in the 1980s when he served as Israel's ambassador to the UN. Stationed in New York City, Netanyahu deepened his know-how and abilities, especially when it came to the all-important skill in navigating the US media landscape. He soon became a fixture on American TV screens. His regular appearances on ABC's Nightline with Ted Koppel solidified his role as the program's go-to quote-unquote terrorism expert. Netanyahu also appeared many times on CNN's Larry King Live, which at the time was one of the network's flagship programs. On a scale of 1 to 10 as a great guest, he is an 8. Larry King once said of Netanyahu, if he had a sense of humor, he would be a 10. While being a frequent guest on these US news shows, Netanyahu learned how easy and effective it was to misdirect the attention of American viewers. He learned how to play fast moving news cycles to create distractions that would conceal Israel's most controversial policies from public scrutiny. And he became a master of distraction and used these skills to shift the American gaze away from Israeli actions. Netanyahu was rather open about this strategy and made arguments that Israel should capitalize on events that distracted the world. In 1989, for instance, after the Tiananmen Square massacre, Netanyahu wrote an article saying that, quote, Israel should have exploited the repressions of the demonstrations in China when world attention focused on that country to carry out mass expulsions among the Arabs of the territories, end quote. Additionally, during slower news cycles, or when there were no major world events that could camouflage the plight of the Palestinians, Netanyahu still found ways to come up with his own distractions. And at times, he did this with great success. In May 1990, for example, Netanyahu was in a meeting with American Jewish leaders who were concerned that the expansion of illegal settlements in East Jerusalem was creating a bad look for Israel. Netanyahu conceded by saying, You're right, it's a big problem for us now. But, he added, it will blow over in a week. There's a much bigger problem that won't go away. Saddam Hussein is the Middle East and Israel's number one problem. The implication, of course, was that illegal settlements would have to take a backseat to more pressing problems. What is remarkable about Netanyahu's handling of the concerns of American Jewish leaders was that he actually had no specific knowledge of the particular threat. By citing Saddam Hussein, he was just throwing a random dart at the dartboard hoping that it might hit the mark and create enough concern to distract attention from what Israel was doing to the Palestinians. And this particular attempt at distraction was serendipitous, as it just so happened to be true. 
Just a few months after Netanyahu proclaimed that Saddam Hussein was the number one problem, Iraq invaded Kuwait. Netanyahu's wild guest helped cement his place within the American media as the foremost terrorism expert. They loved to interview him and BB delivered. He was a master at playing with American audiences and he was a showman who understood the power of images. During the Gulf War for instance, he persuaded a CNN reporter to interview him with gas masks on. Photos show Netanyahu smiling under the mask, almost giddy at the effect this bit of spectacle would have on the American public in generating sympathy for Israel. The absurdity of the stunt even caused Netanyahu to state the obvious. I must say, this is the darnest way to do an interview, he said. What it does show, however, is the threat that Israel faces. I cannot tell you when, I cannot tell you how, but Israel will defend itself. The US media was particularly generous to Netanyahu. They often went even further than the Israeli media to defend his reputation. Even during the lowest points in his political career, it would be the American, not Israeli media, that would throw Netanyahu a lifeline. And one of the most egregious cases of this came right after the assassination of Prime Minister Yishak Rabin in 1995. In the early 1990s, the Israeli Prime Minister Rabin signed the Oslo Accords to begin the peace process with the Palestinian Liberation Organization or PLO. Netanyahu, who was, at the time, leader of the right-wing Likud party, attacked Rabin for signing the accords. He compared the arrangement to the 1938 Munich Agreement, in which the British government ceded parts of Czechoslovakia to Hitler's Germany. You are worse than Chamberlain, Netanyahu said to Rabin in the Israeli Knesset. He endangered another nation, but you are doing it to your own nation. Netanyahu regularly appeared at anti-Rabin rallies. As the right-wing protesters burned effigies of Rabin, they shouted, Death to Rabin, and with blood and fire we will banish Rabin. The crowds even started to harass Rabin outside his residence. They went so far as to target Rabin's wife Leah, taunting her with shouts like, You will be strung up like Mussolini and his mistress. The protests were so extreme that other leaders within Netanyahu's Likud party became squirmish and abandoned the rallies. But not Netanyahu, who continued to show up and stay at anti-Rabin protests. He did not flinch and continued to make speeches, adding further fuel to the flames. After Yishak Rabin was assassinated by a right-wing extremist, everyone within the Israeli media knew the responsibility Netanyahu bore in creating the climate of hate and fear that led to the death of their prime minister. At Prime Minister Rabin's funeral, the widowed wife Leah shook hands with various dignitaries there, but she refused to greet Netanyahu. Days later, PLO Chairman Yasser Arafat also came to console Leah Rabin in her home, but Netanyahu was asked not to come. For a time, it seemed Netanyahu would pay the price for his hardline positions, as his numbers took a nosedive in the polls for the upcoming general election. But as his domestic numbers sank, it was the US media that saved Netanyahu. A week after the murder of Rabin, ABC's Nightline ran a special program featuring various Israeli leaders, including Netanyahu and Rabin's widow, Leah Rabin. As audacious it was to put both Rabin's widow and the man who had participated in rallies that called for his death on the same program, Ted Koppel even went further and posed a question to Leah Rabin that no member of the Israeli media dared to ask. Why, Koppel wanted to know. Has she greeted Arafat warmly, but refused to shake Netanyahu's hand? In Israel, where Netanyahu's complicity in Rabin's death was common knowledge, Leah Rabin's snub was understood for what it was, a denunciation of Netanyahu for his role in stoking right-wing hatred for her husband. Koppel's question turned a widow's grievance into an accusation. She was the one being irrational, and Bibi was the true victim. Abetted by Koppel's question, Netanyahu felt confident enough to tell viewers later in the program that the attacks on him for his role in Rabin's death was McCarthyism at its purest. By furnishing him with TV appearances like these, the US media propped up Netanyahu in ways that could not be expected from the Israeli media. In turn, this conquest of the American airways and halls of power eventually elevated his domestic credentials. His poll numbers improved, and just a year after Rabin's death, he became the youngest prime minister in Israel's history. And we move the capital of Israel to Jerusalem. That's for the evangelicals. You know, it's amazing with that. The evangelicals are more excited about that than Jewish people. It's really, right? It's incredible.
Long before Netanyahu entered the political scene, support for Israel within the United States used to be a fairly liberal cause. Throughout the 1960s and 70s, most American Jews and Zionists were ostensibly left-leaning Democratic voters and aligned more closely with labor Zionists such as the Israeli Prime Minister Ben-Gurion or Golda Meir, and the right-wing Likud party had little base of support within the American Jewish community. But during the 1980s, just around the time Netanyahu served as Israel's UN ambassador, the pro-Israel lobby in the United States shifted from left to right. The American Israel Public Affairs Committee, AIPAC, which used to be liberal-leaning, started to court Republican donors who would support them in their opposition to the Oslo Accords. The Conference of Presidents of Major American Jewish Organizations also drifted to the right with the hiring of a hawk named Malcolm Holing as chief executive. And right-wing Christian Zionists started to get involved in the action to lobby on behalf of Israel as well, with the formation and expansion of Christians United for Israel. Netanyahu found himself in the right place at the right time, just as this transition was taking place. As the conservatives started to take over the pro-Israel lobby, Netanyahu was able to form a powerful donor base, and this base was instrumental in funding his successful campaign to become Prime Minister of Israel. Malcolm Holin of the Conference of Presidents of a Major American Jewish Organizations introduced many wealthy donors to Netanyahu. Bibi also became friends with Republican businessman Ronald Lauder, who brought Netanyahu into contact with other big donors including Donald Trump. Another benefactor was billionaire Charles Kushner, who sometimes hosted Netanyahu in his home, where the future Israeli PM slept in the childhood bedroom of Charles's son Jared Kushner, who would later become the son-in-law and senior advisor to President Trump. And just as he was courting conservative donors in the US, Netanyahu also made contact with the various conservative operatives. He hired GOP consultants to help him hone his political skills. With their assistance, he brought Republican-style campaigning into the Israeli political landscape. In the early 1990s, Netanyahu hired a famous GOP polling expert Frank Luntz. This was followed by the 1996 election that first made Netanyahu Prime Minister. For this successful campaign, Netanyahu also hired Republican guru Arthur Finkelstein, a former advisor for several successful campaigns including those of President Nixon and Reagan. By his own admission, Finkelstein's proudest achievement over a decades-long career running conservative campaigns was turning the word liberal into a pejorative. For Netanyahu's 1996 race, Finkelstein crafted sleek American-style attack ads that had previously never been seen in Israeli politics. Netanyahu's first term as prime minister lasted from 1996 to 1999. A decade later, when he ran again for PM, he once more turned to US strategists. For his successful comeback in 2009, he hired a Republican strategist named John McLaughlin to shape his messaging. McLaughlin would also later go on to work as a polling expert for President Trump. But perhaps no GOP figure has been as influential in maintaining Netanyahu's power as the American casino owner Sheldon Adelson who, before his passing in 2021, was the largest single donor to the Republican Party. Netanyahu and Adelson were especially close, speaking on the phone at least 160 times between 2012 and 2015. The impact Adelson had on Israel cannot be overstated. He spent millions of his own money to promote Netanyahu. One of the ways he did this was by funding Israel's most popular newspaper, Israel Hayom. Critics have nicknamed the Hayom as Bibiton for its peddling of patent propaganda on behalf of the right-wing Likud party. And while the newspaper doesn't make a profit, since it is distributed free of charge, it served as a useful platform for the right-wing American billionaire Adelson to influence Israeli politics from afar. What's especially curious about Netanyahu's relationship with the Republican Party, however, is that the majority of American Jews are actually aligned with the Democratic Party. And while Netanyahu claims to represent international Jewry, his largest base of support within the United States doesn't come from Jews. It comes, instead, from Christian Zionists. These are mostly white American evangelicals who adhere to the belief that God gave Israel to the Jews. In fact, polls show that this Bible-based conviction is stronger by a factor of 80 to 40% among white American evangelicals than it is among American Jews. Meanwhile, the largest pro-Israel advocacy group in America, with over 10 million members, is also not a Jewish-led group. It is Christians United for Israel, led by the evangelical pastor John Hagee. 
In his book, Jerusalem Countdown, A Warning to the World, John Hagee makes the extremely anti-Semitic claim that Adolf Hitler was a half-breed Jew sent by God as a hunter to persecute and drive European Jews towards the only home God ever intended for the Jews in Israel. And yet, Netanyahu is not at all repulsed by this extreme anti-Semite who literally justified the Holocaust. On the contrary, he continues to cozy up with Pastor Hagee, and he regularly speaks at annual Christians United for Israel conferences, hailing the evangelicals as Israel's best friends. The alliance between Netanyahu and evangelical Republicans, who only support Israel as part of the pursuit of Armageddon, is certainly bizarre, but it may be unavoidable. As more and more American Jews, particularly young Jews, lead the protest to end the genocide in Gaza, Netanyahu needs the Christian Zionists to lobby the US government so he can finance his war and fend off international sanctions. And in turn, Netanyahu's primary base of support in the United States is increasingly becoming a group of anti-Semites. As I record this video in May of 2024, it is true now that Netanyahu is a headache for pro-Israel Democrats in the US. President Biden is certainly not pleased with Israel's recent strike on Iran. Israel's actions in Gaza even forced Democratic leaders and staunch Zionists such as Senator Chuck Schumer to call for early elections in Israel to replace Netanyahu. For Democrats, at least, Netanyahu has become something of a scapegoat. They seem to prefer to attack Netanyahu the individual rather than Israel itself, as it provides them with a way to shield themselves from criticism that they are not pro-Israel in the public eye. But anyone on the American side who wants to blame Netanyahu must remember that it was America that created him. He was elevated by the US media. He brought American politics into Israel. If there is blame to be had, it must be shared. In laying out the role Americans played in the creation of Benjamin Netanyahu, I have touched upon the contributions made by discrete political, commercial, and religious motivations. But there is another, more profound ideological point of intersection that we might mention before concluding. As tens of thousands of Palestinians continue to be killed, we could simply blame the ideology of Zionism that demands the expulsion and exclusion of Palestinians. But stopping our analysis there would be a mistake, because in the end, Zionism itself finds its mirror in the American notion of manifest destiny, the quasi-religious conviction that was used to justify the ethnic cleansing of America's native population. The billions of dollars in US foreign aid to Israel, which allows the genocide of Palestinians to continue, is the material manifestation of the shared ideological worldview, that one people has an ordained right to usurp the land and possessions of another. As horrendous as Israel's ethnic cleansing of Palestinians is, it is hardly unique. With the genocide in Gaza, Israel is exercising its own manifest destiny. What is happening in Gaza is a repetition not only of the killings of Native Americans at the hands of Christian nationalists, it finds historical precedent in every settler colonial state that came after the United States, from Canada to Australia. Interestingly, and not coincidentally, these countries also represent some of Israel's biggest supporters. As America gives billions of dollars in aid to Israel, essentially bankrolling the genocide of the Palestinians, it is important to remember how the Zionist ideology used to justify the ethnic cleansing of the native population has a clear correlation with the religious-fueled claims that are part of America's own past. As we witness each day of the ongoing genocide Netanyahu's Israel is committing in Gaza, we must not fall for the trap that this is a uniquely evil action. History did not begin on October 7th, nor did this all start with the Balfour Declaration that established the State of Israel. It is, in significant ways, the culmination of a 400-year history of settler colonialism that had its most extreme manifestation not in Netanyahu's Israel, but in the United States of America.